Welcome to Sight and Sound Bites, the Ioneer Foundation's weekly bi biweekly lunchtime educational webinar series of the research and clinical innovations at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is Do You Hear What I Hear? Applying Neuroimaging Technology to Understand How the Brain Makes Sense of Sound, presented by Dr. Carl Snyderman and Dr. Bharath Chandra Sakharan. I'm Lawton Snyder, I'm the CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck. We work closely with the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide annually to support these two departments stimulate and advance groundbreaking research. And that support is only possible because of philanthropic donations. We thank everybody that supports that work and, uh, and you'll hear a bit of, of work that, that is made possible because of that, that support here today. Uh, before we start today's program, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. For today's webinar chat is disabled. So uh, if you're used to using Zoom and, and going on chat, for, you won't be able to do that for today's program. But um, uh, the Q&A is fully functioning. So uh, we do want you to ask questions. So please get on and type your questions during the program. We'll hold those to the end and I'll read the questions to the panelists after the program is completed. Uh, we'll ask that you refrain from asking personal health information questions, uh, obviously. Um, I, I may skip over some of those, but if you do have questions that you would like the panelists uh, to respond to, you can send us an email um, to uh, the email that's provided with, with Mr. Craig Smith's uh, email address. Tomorrow you'll receive a survey via email to provide us with feedback. You'll also be added to our email list to receive future webinars. Introducing today's program and speakers is uh, Dr. Jonas Johnson, MD, Distinguished Service Professor and Chairman, Department of Otolaryngology, and the Eugene N. Myers Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Johnson. So thank you, Yolani, and uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're charged with doing in healthcare is to make uh, next year better than last year. And this afternoon, we have an interesting uh, juxtaposition of a surgeon, uh, Dr. Carl Snyderman, and an investigator, Dr. Uh, Bharath Shadra Shakaran. And they're gonna uh, demonstrate to you some of the activity that's going on that we hope will lead to improvements in healthcare in our lifetime. So with that, uh, uh, let's move on to the presentations. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hi, I'm Carl Snyderman, and uh, um, you know, as a head and neck surgeon, uh, we deal with the most valuable real estate in, in the body. I would say. I mean, the head and neck is the part of your body that has the most senses that interact with the environment. It's how we interpret and, and make sense of our environment. We have the traditional senses of olfaction, you know, sense of smell, of vision, hearing, taste, and even touch. Um, um, but there are other important functions uh, of the head and neck area that, that play a role in, in how we function in day-to-day -day life, and that includes our voice box, our airway, so which is the source of, of sound production, but also a conduit for breathing and protection of our lungs, and also the swallowing passage. Um, unfortunately, we deal with many conditions that affect the senses and impair uh, individual's ability to uh, interpret or, and interact with their environment. And this could be include, you know, a congenital syndrome, a birth defect with the loss of hearing. Um, it could be uh, syndromes uh, such, as, uh, such as autism. Um, there can also be tumors that affect the function of, the, of these organs. Um, neurologic disorders such as MS, uh, strokes, uh, head trauma, all of these things that can have a severe impact uh, on these key senses. And so, you know, one of our goals is to help restore this function, um, uh, but that requires having a better understanding of how these senses work together. And uh, as a surgeon, I have um, been working with some engineering students on developing medical devices that help protect the airway and the, and the swallowing passage. Uh, but after hearing Dr. Chandra Shakaran uh, give a, a wonderful lecture recently, 
uh, we decided to partner on uh, communication disorders and trying to understand how our patients are impaired in their ability to process sounds and speech. Dr. Chandrasekharan. Thank you, Dr. Snyderman and Dr. Johnson. I'm really excited for this partnership. Uh, and the next half an hour or so, I'm gonna share some of the work from uh, my lab and my collaborators, uh, broadly on the topic of, uh, you know, how do we hear, how do we make sense of, uh, of sounds and uh, leverage uh, neuroimaging technology. So my lab studies uh, speech and auditory processing. And so we try to make sense of, uh, of, of the, the auditory system. So, so we, we constantly deal with a barrage of sounds and our brain needs to make some sense of it. So the, the, the cochlea deconstructs all those sounds and the rest of the brain has this very complex task of putting those sounds back together and attributing some meaning to it. So this process of encoding information and then uh, uh, matching it to existing templates in our brain and, and making some meaningful sense out of it is a really complicated process. And my, my lab for the last 15 years has been working at what is this interface of neurobiology and linguistics uh, in looking at sound transformation to speech. This is a really complex process. I want to make a case that speech as an example of a sound that we constantly in encounter is incredibly challenging to process. We hear about 16,000 spoken words a day, uh, and you know that can occur really fast. We, we can tolerate about four to 12 syllables per second. Uh, speech carries information, not only about what is being said, but also who is talking, um, what's the emotional state of that individual. But we can also get in, uh, information about, uh, about where that person may be from, uh, information related to dialect. There's a lot of information that simultaneously comes in in the sound input. And to make the matter worse, talkers are inherently variable because the vocal tract sizes for each talker is different and unique. And, uh, and speech often occurs in really challenging listening conditions. So this is a very common complaint uh, in lots of individuals with, uh, with hearing loss, but also individuals uh, who are older, that uh, they understand speech just fine in quiet, but really struggle uh, when there's background noise. Speech and sound recognition is also very context dependent. So it's not just an auditory sense that drives speech understanding, but we all know, especially now with the pandemic and masks being the norm, uh, understanding speech without the aid of visual cues makes it much more challenging. I wanted to highlight this, this contextual dependence of speech with, uh, with three examples to make the case that it's more than what meets the ear. So there's some audio clips here. Uh, the first is a very well-studied phenomena called the verbal transformation effect. So your goal here is to listen while you watch this video and uh, all that the audio here uh, is going to repeat is Bill, but I want to I want to say that after seeing this, you'll see that sound transform in your brain. So obviously the sound was the same, but that, that should have transformed in your head based on the context. Another classic example of a perceptual pop-out is called sine wave speech. Here we take speech in its essential form and remove everything from it except the three important frequencies that drive speech. And to the untrained ear, that should sound very much like it should sound like a non-speech, you know, something like from a cartoon. But I'm going to play what that original sound was. <laughs> 
The man's, the man's painting, painting a, a sign. sign. And now you should feel this pop out. And the third, third uh, example I wanted to highlight, and this, this became quite a sensation a, a couple of years ago, uh, was this audio clip that was ambiguous. Literally half the people who heard it heard one word and the other half heard another. So, so you should be roughly hear this either as Laurel or Yanni. And it's really not clear why some people hear Laurel and some people hear Yanni. Laurel. 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 So hopefully those, those made that case that, uh, that speech understanding is much more than what meets the ear. So how does the brain make sense of sound? How do we study this really complex phenomena of speech? We can use animal models uh, and it has been used highly effectively. And so this is one way to, to really decode what the brain is doing when it has to encounter speech signals. Uh, with, with animal models, we can directly record from the brain and from parts of the brain, the auditory uh, regions of the brain uh, and, and try to interpret um, but with humans, we are mostly restricted to non-invasive neuroimaging methods. So we have to uh, understand what the brain is doing without really messing around inside the brain. Animal models have revealed uh, a tremendous architecture, really complex architecture that uh, underlies uh, uh, sound encoding. And this involves multiple brainstem structures, the cochlear nucleus, the inferior colliculus, the, the, the subcortical structures like the medial geniculate body, very, very intricate uh, ascending pathway. So the sense information from the cochlea to the brain. What's less understood, and we're making a lot of headway on it, including some, some really cool work from, uh, from the Department of Otolaryngology, is the effects of the efferent pathway. These are top-down connections. So these top-down connections connect the brain, the ear, um, uh, it sends information from the brain back to the ear. So it forms kind of a feedback loop. And, and the real uh, reason, the function of this efferent pathway, it's even more massive than the afferent, the bottom-up connections, uh, is really unclear. So that's, there's a lot of really interesting work coming out. And animal models have really allowed us to detail the, the, the anatomy and physiology underlying the auditory system. But as I mentioned, in, in humans, uh, it's, it's much more challenging uh, to find out what's going on inside our brain uh, in, in this box that we can't really open and mess around. We have to make educated inferences. We kind of listen for the rattle uh, and we have non-invasive neuroimaging methods. This is not uh, new. We've had, uh, we ha we've had these methods since about the 1900s. Um, so uh, I'm gonna focus today on one particular method called uh, electroencephalography. Uh, these are recordings from electrodes attached non-invasively to the scalp. These pick up electrical fields generated from, from simultaneous firing of neural ensembles. So these are um, uh, firings from the various auditory regions in the brain in response to sound that we can pick up at the scalp. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is not a new technology. It's been around since the 1920s. But there's, there's been a few points where there's been rapid application of this technology. So one is uh, when uh, electroencephalography was extensively started being used to identify the foci of epilepsy. More recently, since the 2000s, uh, electroencephalography has made a significant com comeback into the clinical domain. Uh, and, and there's been a, a brain computer interfaces that leverages electroencephalography. But with the advent of advanced machine learning approaches and more data-driven uh, science, there's been a lot more uh, interest and uh, application uh, for electroencephalography. I'm going to talk about a particular uh, response that we get from the electroencephalography. This is a response called the frequency following response. And I'm going to use the term FFR to refer to it from now on. So there's, you're going to hear a lot of FFRs. In my lab and other labs, uh, we measure the FFRs uh, in response to sounds. Uh, 
And this could be any kind of complex periodic sounds. It could be speech, it could be music. Um, we present these sounds through these insert earphones and we have a single scalp electrode uh, um, that's located on top of the head. The participant just chills and relaxes and watches a movie while the sounds are presented repetitively. So they, they hear sounds like da, 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 da. While they're watching TV, they're asked to ignore the sounds. The neat thing about the, the response that we can measure from the scalp is that it is a neurophonic. So it really reflects the fidelity of sound encoding. So that's the stimulus and you can see the brain response um, mimics the stimulus or most of the elements of the stimulus. This response comes from multiple neural ensemble across the auditory pathway. So increasingly we are realizing that the frequency following response is a good integrated measure of the fidelity of sound encoding in the brain. Uh, and many labs, including mine, have, uh, have come up with demonstrations. I'm, I'm, playing, uh, I'm going to play a few demonstrations uh, from um, Nina Krause's lab at Northwestern and Erika Skoy's lab at University of Connecticut. Something that we have done across different labs is uh, record um, uh, brain waves to different types of sounds. This could be speech, it could be music. Uh, and we record the, the brain waves and then convert it into a wave file and we can actually play it back. And it sounds, should sound a, a noisy, noisier version of the sound that evokes it. So here's an example, this is the sound da. da. So that's the da. sound wave and this is the brain wave. Now this is a higher uh, pitch da. This is the brain da. wave. You can see that uh, the frequency following response uh, shows high fidelity to pitch. So it represents low pitch and high pitch really well. Something my colleagues did uh, as an example was record the frequency following response for every note in the piano so that they could take any song and convert it into brain music. And uh, this is work from Erika Skoy showing uh, the frequency following response to the theme song from Game of Thrones. So you should hear the sound and the, the, the frequency following response, which is kind of the noisier version of the sound uh, simultaneously. Right, so, so those are fun uh, examples, but we've been applying um, the frequency following responses to study uh, complex phenomena related to experience and how experience shapes an individual's response to sounds. Uh, and uh, something that my lab has been showing across many studies is that the frequency following response reflects individual experiences, lifelong experiences, the experiences that you, you accumulate uh, over the lifespan. And uh, to, to, for, for an experimental approach, we've leveraged uh, tone languages like Mandarin Chinese. So Mandarin has uh, four uh, tonal patterns. And so these are, um, these are pitch changes within a single syllable that in Mandarin and other tone languages can change the word meaning. So I'll give you examples here. So there are four tone categories. These categories, these tone categories function just like vowels and consonants do uh, in English and other languages. Uh, but here, pitch changes within the syllable make a difference. So I'll give you some examples. So ma, ma, the sound, the syllable ma with a level pitch is called tone one and refers to mother. With a ma. rising tone refers to a hemp. And with the with a dipping tone, so you could hear the, the dip there in the pitch, uh, refers to horse. And uh, a falling pitch pattern with the same syllable uh, it signifies mother. I'm sorry, it's too scold. So it's easy to confuse uh, as, a, as an English learner trying to learn these tone, tone patterns. It's, a, it's really challenging because you can, 
you can really uh, um, uh, mess up the percept and the percept of words if you if you if you're not able to disambiguate the the pitch patterns. So uh, something that we do is record uh, the frequency following responses to these sound patterns. In this case, uh, it's a it's the it's the syllable e with a with a dipping tone e, and we record it across uh, many different types of participants. So in uh, in red is the frequency following response, and you can see how it faithfully uh, mimics the stimulus that evokes it. Uh, and this is from a native Mandarin speaker. So they, they, are, they, they, were, they were born and brought up on Mandarin Chinese as their primary language. And you can see to the right, right is uh, from a non-native English participant. And if you notice immediately, you can see that the frequency following response uh, follows the, the stimulus trajectory that's in black. But in the English participant, it's just not as robust so the tracking of the pitch, the dynamic change in pitch patterns isn't as robust as it is in a native uh, Chinese participant. And this is work done by multiple labs that's been replicated. And this is originally shown by Krishnan and colleagues at Purdue University. So what we can do is extract the, the voice pitch from the stimulus and extract the voice pitch from the frequency falling response, the brain wave. So the sound wave and the brain wave, and then we can see how similar are they. So in the native participant, you can see that uh, you can see that uh, there is significant similarity. So the 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 brain uh, wave is really tracking the dynamic change in pitch pattern, but in the non-native English participant, you can see that there's some amount of tracking, but it's really not that effective. We have found that these experience dependent effects, so these language effects um, are stable across multiple days of recording. So in a native uh, Chinese listener, the frequency following response, whether it's from day one, day two, or day three, looks almost identical. And in a native uh, English listener who doesn't have any prior exposure to, to languages like Mandarin, the response again is not as robust. So the stimulus response tells you how, the fidelity, so the larger this number is, the, the greater is the fidelity of the brain response to the sound, evoking sound. And you can see that language really shapes the, the response pattern. So if you have exposure, this is meaningful, this is relevant to your language, you encode it um, much better. Something that's also interesting is that uh, we have found that the frequency following response uh, indicates what sound is being presented. So we can decode what sound is evoking the frequency following response. But we can also decode who the listener is based on this response. So it, it also serves as a biometric that, uh, that allows you to kind of track an individual's accumulated experience that's unique to them themselves. This, this experience-dependent plasticity need not necessarily be specific. So uh, these, this is a uh, study from uh, 2007 that showed that uh, um, English listeners who, uh, who were musicians, so they had about 10 years of musical training and considered themselves as musicians and learned music pretty early in life, they showed better tracking of these non-native Mandarin pitch patterns. So remember that the musician group and the non-musician groups are both English listeners with no prior exposure to Mandarin. But sound encoding is much better, more high fidelity uh, in the musician relative to the non-musician. So something that we were excited about uh, is, to, is to see in the mature brain, so these are in adults, in English listeners, can we train English listeners up to be as good and as accurate in recognizing these tone patterns as, uh, as Chinese listeners. And this wasn't easy. This was work by my graduate student, uh, Rachel Ritsky, uh, who, uh, who's now applying these frequency following response uh, 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 measure in children with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, something that she did was, uh, was um, get a, a, a 20 uh, English listeners uh, to commit to a really long training program. 
So the training program was a sound to tone category mapping program. So we used multiple talkers. The English learner had to, had to learn that there were four categories in Mandarin Chinese and consistently map the sounds to those categories. This is not an easy task for English listeners and some took uh, close to 20, 21 days uh, to reach maximum proficiency. So we trained people uh, they came back to the lab and, and, and got the auditory training uh, every day until they reached a stage where they were experienced. And then we trained them for 10 more days after. And then we told them, you know, you can chill. You don't need to come back for training. Um, we, 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 we got them back after two months uh, for a retention task to see if any change that we made is that retained. And so at every time point, we measured the frequency falling response. So these are native English listeners uh, who have received auditory training. And something that we found was that initially when, uh, when the listener was a novice learner, uh, their frequency following response, and that's the tracking that you see, the, this is the native listener. For the, for the learner who's at the novice stage, tracking is pretty bad. But over training, tracking slowly starts getting better. So, the brain is able, their brain is now able to latch on to these very subtle changes in pitch patterns. That was, that's something that uh, 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 native Chinese listeners are very adept at. What's neat is that uh, when they came back after uh, two months where they did no training, those changes, uh, which, is, uh, which is basically the auditory system now getting tuned to the sound patterns of Mandarin, are retained. So they retain two months after the training stopped. So we can change the frequency falling response, which reflects very fundamental sound encoding in the adult brain. This is, uh, I just wanted to highlight some recent work from, uh, this is a collaboration with University of Washington with uh, Dr. Patricia Kuo and uh, Dr. Christina Zhao. What they did was record um, the frequency following responses to the, the dipping tone, the E sound, uh, in English exposed lis uh, listeners. So these are infants from seven months of age. So one of the neat things about the frequency following responses is that we can measure it even uh, in, uh, in toddlers, neonates. So uh, we can measure it across the lifespan. So in this example, we got them to come back after four months. So they, they first had the frequency following responses measured, and then four months later, we had them uh, come in again. So this age range from seven months to about uh, a year is really interesting. It's, it's referred to often as a phonetic sensitivity period. So this is kind of a time point where the, the infant brain changes to start representing sounds of their language better but it actually comes at a cost of representing sounds that are not in their language. So all infants, uh, all, all um, uh, right at newborns start off almost as language universal and they slowly start committing uh, neurally to their language. What we found was that uh, uh, in green is, the, is the, the pitch of the stimulus and in blue, is the pitch of the stimulus of, of the frequency following response at seven months. What we found was that initially uh, the, the seven month old response is, has real high fidelity, but in this phonetic sensitivity period, as we straddle the, the edges of the phonetic uh, sensitivity period, at about 11 months, the tracking actually becomes worse. So it becomes worse because these kind of dynamic changes of pitch in English is not that relevant. So the brain loses almost interest and doesn't commit to these dynamic changes. So this is exciting work. We are following these, these, uh, these infants up and uh, we're expanding the, the range of stimuli that uh, they, uh, they encounter. As I mentioned before, this is, this, the frequency following response has been looked at in children with autism spectrum disorders. This is an example from a really old paper that shows that uh, relative to typically developing children, in children with autism spectrum disorders, the tracking of this, of this falling pitch pattern is just uh, is, is not even close. You can see this example exemplar um, 
child with uh, autism spectrum disorders, they, they're not tracking the, the changes in pitch trajectory. And this is really important. Uh, so the, the, the dynamic change in pitch uh, may be not as relevant uh, for English listeners at the level of the syllable, uh, but for English listeners, these, these dynamic pitch trajectories are very important because that's the difference between a statement or a question or emotional prosody. So uh, detecting very subtle changes in prosody, these are all important things. So your brain needs to be tracking these, these sound patterns with high fidelity for you to make sense of those things. Um, other labs and uh, in our lab have also looked at the frequency following response to unravel the relationship between age-related hearing impairment and cognitive function. Uh, and I, I know there was a, a, a webinar series um, um, uh, earlier with uh, Dr. Catherine Palmer, who had uh, presented some of the work related to uh, cognitive decline, the relationship between uh, hearing impairment and um, uh, untreated hearing impairment and cognitive decline. Um, there's been uh, emerging studies using the frequency following response uh, to study age-related changes as well as plasticity tracked by the frequency following response. So uh, in individuals with untreated hearing loss, so this is individuals with hearing impairment, um, this is a spectrum. So it represents all the different frequencies uh, that are critical to speech processing. And you can see that the darker shade uh, individuals with hearing impairment, they actually overrepresent uh, these, these very gross uh, 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 frequencies in the speech signal. So it's almost like they're working extra hard to so the brain regions that are responsible for processing uh, the, these uh, sound encoding uh, are inefficient and are exaggerated in, in how they encode information. And this is potentially exhausting, right? So to, to constantly uh, uh, leverage the, the nervous system to track things uh, that's not, uh, that's more easily tracked by individuals with, uh, uh, with typical hearing uh, comes at a cost. Um, there's work with, uh, with looking at frequency following responses in individuals with uh, mild cognitive impairment and very similar patterns. So this is the frequency following response uh, it to, to the sound OO in uh, individuals who, who are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and with, uh, with uh, neurotypical controls. And again, you see this exaggerated uh, um, encoding of, uh, of the frequency following responses in individuals with cognitive impairment. Again, we've not started making this link between untreated hearing loss and mild cognitive impairment, but uh, the frequency following responses may be a very useful uh, biometric that can identify uh, symptoms early. Well, if there's exaggerated responses uh, uh, indexed by the frequency following responses, there's also kind of loss of subtlety. Uh, and so I'm showing you here older adults with subclinical deficits. Uh, this is work by Samira Anderson uh, from uh, University of Maryland. She, she basically showed that uh, uh, there's some older adults who, uh, who understand speech in challenging listening in my environments really well, and some who, who really struggle not in quiet, but only in noisy conditions. And so that's what uh, these two signify. The top performer here has incredible uh, speech understanding in noisy environments. The bottom performer does okay in quiet, but the second you add noise, they struggle. So she was looking at uh, the frequency following response as a marker of these individual differences in listening ability. And she found that the frequency following response was very similar between the top performer and the bottom performer uh, in quiet conditions. But when there's noise, you can start seeing that uh, the frequency following response really becomes bad in the poor, poor uh, listener, whereas in the good listener, um, they, they don't seem to be as affected by the introduction of noise. So this is very a fundamental work that basically shows that there's uh, individual differences in listening ability and the frequency following response can be a strong marker of those individual differences. Her lab went one step further. They, uh, they took these individuals who were, who were not great performers 
uh, who really struggle understanding speech and noise. And, uh, and they had a, a long-term uh, auditory brain training program and they measured the frequency following response before and after. So this brain training program uh, was by Posit Science and uh, it really uh, emphasizes uh, multiple skills involved in processing speech in challenging listening environments. And something she found was that so the in black are uh, the frequency following response in quiet and noise uh, prior to training. And uh, you can see that uh, post training that's in red, there's better timing that's that's being picked up by the frequency following response. So the timing mismatch between uh, listening in quiet and noise uh, is ameliorated to some extent. So there's obviously lots of utility. So I, you know, I, I, I sound like, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is, this is the one response for everything, uh, but there's a lot of excitement. It's, it's not, by the way, the EEG tracks lots of other interesting uh, biometrics as, as well as uh, biomarkers. Um, but I'm really excited about the frequency following response because it, it really is a non-invasive way to look at uh, encoding fidelity, uh, given the challenges that we can't actually record directly from, uh, from humans. Uh, we can't go inside the auditory structures and record. So this is, gives us a very strong non-invasive response that's integrated across multiple neural regions uh, within the auditory system. And it can be recorded, I mentioned in newborns, in older adults, it can be recorded regardless of age, language, motivation. Uh, we, we get people to watch TV and, uh, and, and they, uh, they are... Uh, you know, they, they can do this for hours, actually, uh, and they request very minimal involvement from the individual themselves uh, or attention. So it can be leveraged in, in difficult to test populations, um, and it captures acoustic details of speech sounds with, with pretty high fidelity. And uh, I've shown you some work that suggests that there's experience-dependent responses, so it can be a good marker for something like uh, oral rehabilitation or uh, auditory training. And it's very reliable within an individual. So if I bring you back after a week, your response pretty much looks like how it was a week before, unless you've had a, a significant auditory experience in between. So this image here is basically shows uh, the response, the frequency following response to the sound da um, recorded from individuals from uh, uh, newborns to, to much older adults. And you can see there's subtle differences across uh, the, the age range, but for the most part, uh, there's great amount of fidelity uh, and you know, um, uh, intersubject uh, similarity uh, that's, that can be seen. So I think our challenge, uh, really, the next stage is, is taking this from, from our lab. And, and I'm, I'm showing you uh, an example. Uh, this is our lab uh, at Forbes Tower at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and this is an anechoic chamber. And so we, we do very carefully controlled experiments. Uh, this is time consuming. So, so uh, and, and the experiments are very experimental and they're not ecologically valid. So we, we do, um, we present the same sounds over and over again. Uh, this is not exciting to the participants, engaging, um, but it allows us to carefully control um, the, the environment. Uh, our challenge uh, is to take this, this marker, uh, and I, I mentioned it's time consuming. All, everything I've showed you so far relied on uh, averages of thousands of recordings of the frequency following response. So this takes about 25 to 30 minutes. And, and you know, that's, 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 the, that's a lot of time when you think about uh, what we need in a clinic. So uh, I took an image here of uh, Dr. Palmer. Uh, our hope is, uh, is that we, we, we take this from the lab to the, the clinic. And in, to do so, we have a number of challenges that we're hoping to, to counter. The other challenge is, uh, is taking this to the real world. So this is a real example of EEG use in classrooms. And you can see the researcher here uh, and, and children. This may look science fiction, but I can assure you this is completely safe. And there are actually a few experiments that have happened before uh, using uh, the electroencephalography 
in a classroom setting. So the teacher uh, ha also has an EEG uh, uh, set here as to the children. Something that the study found was that uh, the more in sync, so um, the more their EEG signal is in sync with the teacher, um, the better the learning in those uh, students. So there's some students who didn't sync really well, who were less engaged, and some children who were in more in sync uh, and therefore more engaged. So, um, you know, this is a one-off example of every thousand papers that are in the lab. We have one of these really cool papers where uh, this technology is being applied in the real world. Um, my lab has been taking down these challenges one by one. So one of the ways that we have been able to reduce the time needed to test for uh, the frequency following response. Um, so we've, we've done these experiments where uh, we've used machine learning approaches uh, that are done online. And uh, we've shown that we can go from 2000 trials to just needing 500 trials. So cutting down the, the session recording time uh, by more than half. Um, and we can, we, can, we can actually even preserve uh, with these minimal uh, number of uh, 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 trials, we still preserve the core difference in this case between Chinese and English listeners. So we're still being able to capture something that's biologically relevant, um, but with fewer trials and therefore fewer time. It's not just to do with the, the trials as well. We can also reduce the complexity of the sound itself. So this tells you how much of the sound that we need to present uh, to preserve the difference between Chinese and English listeners. And you can see that the differences uh, between language groups, biologically relevant information is present even when we, when, when we reduce the sound from 500 milliseconds to about 50 milliseconds. So our hope is to really come up and package a five minute test uh, that can be done in the clinic. I mentioned that these are not, the sounds that we use are not ecologically uh, valid. Uh, we've been experimenting with more ecologically valid stimuli. So the idea here is, uh, is, is instead of presenting sounds repetitively with you know, carrying no meaning, can we actually engage listeners in an active listening task? So listening to an audiobook, something that's really, really common and ecologically valid. Um, so in this experiment, we had listeners listen to uh, uh, older adults, um, listen to, uh, to uh, an audiobook, and this is Alice's Adventures in, in Wonderland. And uh, they, they, there are two different tasks. So in one of the tasks, they had to attend to the speech. In the other task, they had to attend to, you're going to hear little beeps. I'm going to play the audio right now. They're going to be little beeps. We asked them to count the number of beeps that happened. And uh, we, we kept track of how they were performing uh, uh, repeatedly through the experiment. So just to make sure that people were really um, focused in on the task itself. So here's an example. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations. So the participants at the end of this passage are asked questions related to that particular section, uh, or they're asked to tell, report the number of beeps they heard. They heard. So something that we can do with uh, machine learning approaches is take that uh, entire section of an audiobook and break it down to individual speech sounds. So there are thousands of examples of a burr or a purr. Uh, and we can record the brain average uh, response to, um, to individual sound patterns, and then look at how the brain organizes these sound patterns into a meaningful classes. So uh, these, are, uh, these are time lock EEG responses to, um, to speech sound categories. When individuals are attending to speech, we can see that uh, there's uh, the, the, the different categories so vowels versus more plosive like consonant sounds, these categories are more distinct. But when listeners are not listening to the speech, so then attending to the, to the beeps instead, uh, their, um, their brain encoding of sound information is much more diffuse. It's not like they're not encoding it at all. It's much more diffuse. So this is work in, in preparation that hopefully I think will replace um, uh, these, these ecologically less valid approaches 
and, and have people just sit in a clinic uh, with electrodes hooked up, listen to very, very natural passages uh, and, and get very complex uh, assessments of, of their brain response. Uh, we also need to characterize the neurobiology more effectively. So, uh, you know, the advantage of the EEG is that it's very easy, it's non-invasive, but it just can't completely replace invasive approaches. So we need to be, we need to integrate uh, invasive and non-invasive approaches. And I'm um, very happy to, uh, to, to mention this exciting collaboration with uh, Taylor Abel, who's a neurosurgeon, uh, Tobias T-shirt, uh, who is in the Department of Psychiatry, and Sri Vatsan Saragopan, who is in neurobiology. So this cross-disciplinary team, uh, we've, we've come together, we've harmonized our recording protocols. So I mentioned the four uh, Mandarin sound patterns. We've now recorded this in patients with, uh, with, uh, with invasive uh, um, recordings. So this is from the auditory cortex directly. Uh, and these are in patients with, with chronic epilepsy who have brain implants. Uh, and we've recorded from, uh, from the scalp, we've recorded uh, EEG from macaques, from uh, frequency volume responses from macaques and guinea pigs. In these animal models, we can dive deep and go from, uh, from you know, looking at a very, very big picture that we get from the frequency volume responses to actually look at uh, units, so um, neural units or neural ensembles um, that, that are encoding this information in the brain. So we're putting this together in, in using uh, very modern uh, analytical approaches and uh, computational modeling. So that's kind of where we're going in the next five years. Also, uh, this, this collaboration uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Snyderman had mentioned, uh, we've been funded by the Edith L. Threes Foundation uh, over the next two years to really fast track uh, clinical translation. So, so this, the, the basic science work and the clinical, clinically focused work where we're, we're looking at, uh, at multiple neuroimaging methods that are portable in children and uh, older adults with communication disorders. So leveraging these non-invasive imaging approaches. So right now, communication disorders uh, across the lifespan are primarily assessed uh, using uh, standardized tests, behavioral tests, um, self-reports, uh, and, and these have served, uh, in, uh, served really well thus far. Um, but ultimately, a majority of these communication disorders have to do with the brain. And I want to argue that this use of more portable neuroimaging technology, uh, overcoming all those challenges I mentioned are critical in, uh, in better assessment and ultimately better rehabilitation in individuals with communication disorders. So I'm really excited about this partnership with Dr. Snyderman to set this in motion. Uh, I know I went through a lot, so uh, you know, um, open. We, we are open to to questions, and I can you know um, uh, take take any questions that you have at this point. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Barath. This is this is really impressive work, and and you know what? It, it, for me, every time I've heard this, it's it's become more interesting. I'll actually start with a question. We've gotten, uh, we have a few questions, actually quite a few questions already that have come up and I'll read those. But um, I wanna know from the rest of the panelists that are on here, Jonas and uh, Dr. Snyderman, Dr. Johnson, uh, I heard Laurel, did you guys hear, anybody hear Yanni? I, I, thought, I thought that was interesting. All I heard was Laurel. How many people would, would hear something different? Jonas, what'd you hear? Carl? I heard Laurel. Did you really? Okay. So that, I just thought that was very interesting. But uh, thank you. So um, uh, first question here, would it be beneficial for persons to have testing repeated at different times throughout the day? Uh, personal with neurological issues can be impacted by fatigue and it can affect a person's ability to hear as the day goes along. Who would like to answer that? Roth? Yeah, I can take that question. That's an excellent question. So I mentioned the next five years, what we, we, we're going to be doing. Something that we are also doing is simultaneously 
measuring the frequency following response as an example uh, with other measures of arousal. So we measure uh, pupil responses. So pupils really track um, subtle changes in, in participants' uh, attention and arousal uh, uh, periodically. So we're trying to relate these measures. And I, I think that's absolutely the case that there may be very, very subtle differences um, uh, you know, depending on the time at which you're recording. Uh, and we are definitely trying to, to, to track that. Um, and I want to say that the FFRs are pretty stable. Um, there are some subtle fluctuations in the amplitude of the response, depending on, uh, on the subject state, but for the most part, they're, they're pretty good. Fantastic. So how much do you suppose the different pathways might be involved with tinnitus or hyperacusis? Barat? Yeah, uh, a topic that's really, uh, you know, something that we are very, very excited to, to pursue. Um, so current ideas of, uh, of tinnitus and uh, to some extent hyperacusis uh, are suggested that there are some levels of, uh, of uh, uh, peripheral dysfunction. So something that's, that affects hearing in very subtle ways. And there's hyper um, response from the, from the brain. So, so what we call this as, uh, as homeostatic normalization. So the, the brain uh, exaggeratedly responds and tries to fix this issue. Uh, and we've been measuring uh, the frequency following response and other uh, brain measures. So we've been re uh, using the auditory brainstem response. Uh, and it's, it, that, that really uh, is a is an onset response to a click. So something like this. So really fast responses that come from the auditory brainstem. And uh, something others have reported in tinnitus, even with those with no obvious uh, hearing impairment, uh, is that one of the waves, the early wave is affected, but a later wave that happens much more in the midbrain uh, actually is overcompensates. So, so, you know, it, it's a really interesting disorder. I mentioned plasticity, mostly from a positive experience perspective, uh, where we talked about musical experience and auditory training. But this is an example where there can be a subtle peripheral issue that leads to pretty tremendous, uh, you know, changes um, that can also be tracked by these, these non-invasive measures. Very good. So I've got a lot of questions. So can you speak more of the verbal transform transformation effect? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, hopefully that was a useful demonstration. I, you know, there, there may be people who nothing happened and I'm, I'm always uh, wary of that in, in, uh, you know, in, in when I'm doing these, these talks. Um, but in case that changed in your head, uh, that's primarily because the auditory system uh, pretty much gets bored the, the incoming stimulus is just rep, you know, repetitive. Uh, you know, the, the, the system's very much geared towards novelty. And if it doesn't get the novelty, it kind of makes stuff up. And that is what we, we perceive as the, the transformation. And I mentioned that some of these tests that we use for frequency following responses are exactly that. So we, we have people listen to the same sound over and over again. And, uh, there's all kinds of transformation that's happening in the brain. So I'm hoping that one way to reduce that would be to have more engaging, more novel stimuli that listeners actually care about. Would things like uh, a tumor or removal of a tumor um, change hearing and decoding in the brain? You know, something that hasn't been systematically tested. Uh, I, I'd assume that they, they would and uh, and so, uh, I, I want to mention that the, the, uh, the frequency following response isn't applied in clinic yet, but there are a number of methods that's available in, uh, in audiology clinics. And this includes the auditory brainstem response. This, this basically tells you the sound information reaching uh, these different brain regions uh, um, and robustly in terms of speed and in terms of, in, in terms of timing in terms of how large it is. And those measures have been extensively used in, uh, in individuals with tumors and uh, post-surgery and found to be very useful metrics. The frequency following response that I mentioned is much more useful uh, in conditions where uh, you know, you, you, you're able to hear pretty well, 
but you're not able to understand what's what's going on or what you know the uh, using more complex stimuli like speech that's where i see the utility so uh do you need subjects with uh, neurological issues for your additional studies I, absolutely I, I think uh you know this th there are many different studies that are ongoing uh and I'd, I'd welcome you know ideas uh and we are open for business we officially restarted our research uh you know post uh, or uh after uh, appropriate precautions for the pandemic uh so I'd, I'd welcome opportunities so what role does musical expertise play in the ffr in response to speech across the board studies have shown that uh, uh you know expert musicians uh encode sound information uh with greater fidelity and, and this is especially true uh, when sound is presented in noise. So they're better able to disambiguate uh, sound, sounds from noise. Now, it can be a double-edged sword. And that's something that I, I wanted you know, uh, to, to mention. Um, musicians are also uh, risk takers with respect to noise and news hearing loss. We know that um, they are, they ha they're probably exposed as a group to much uh, louder, much more noise than um, than other groups, and that itself can can affect the the frequency calling response. So, noise exposure and peripheral issues can impact uh, the frequency calling response. So we see a lot of heterogeneity as a group, more robust FFRs, better encoding, but. You know, you really have to account also for uh, individuals with excessive noise exposure. So those kinds of studies are being done right now, very carefully track musical expertise and tease it apart from uh, noise induced hearing issues. Well, uh, thank you. And, and, and thank you, Dr. Riley, for letting us know that you heard Laurel like, like I did. Um, do we have any, uh, well, actually this question maybe we'll, uh, we'll take online because maybe I can have Dr. Uh, Sinopoulos more insights into tinnitus uh, related to this. I think you did answer that previously. So you mentioned that FFR can be a biomarker for cognitive impairment. What are the applications for pediatric populations, specifically auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder or auditory processing disorder? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And I'll refer, uh, uh, you know, uh, refer you to uh, um, Nina Cross's website from Northwestern University, where she studied both those populations. Something she's doing a lot right now is looking at the frequency following response in, uh, in, in uh, children with uh, traumatic brain injuries, concussions, as an example. Uh, so you can, you can see that this response captures a lot uh, and you know, it's, it's a marker for a lot of different issues. But at, at its core, it comes down to this. Um, Sound encoding is a very complex process because sounds unfold rapidly over time. So any neurological dysfunction that impacts, you know, the, the, the uh, can have very subtle uh, uh, issues uh, turn up in these measures of temporal processing. And that's what we're, we're trying to, we, we capture in a, in a whole swath of diseases. Okay. Um, I, uh, I hope that you can still hear me here. Not if you can, because I, I, I lost. Hello, uh, Baroth. Uh, I'm having some computer issues. So oh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry about that. A technical issue here. Uh, do you think that the frequent exposing, uh, frequent exposing of infants to foreign languages, especially tonal languages in the months four to 11 months would make a difference in that person's ability to note that in adulthood? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. And uh, this is an exciting partnership we, we have going on with, uh, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, some researchers in Montreal, uh, where we are tracking uh, international adoptees. And, and, and basically these are individuals uh, who spend uh, the first few years of their life in uh, mainland China and uh, are right now in Canada, uh, and they're older now. So that's exactly what we're testing. And uh, hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to give you a very precise answer. I, I, think, I think the answer is yes, that they would retain some element uh, of their uh, encoding advantages 
uh, but nobody has done that yet. And that's a, that's a really excellent question. Okay, so does the FFR require binaural symmetry for your subjects? Uh, could you repeat that? I, I missed a... Does the FFR require binaural symmetry for your subjects? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the details are much of what, uh, what I showed you today were uh, recordings from both years presented simultaneously. Um, but there, there are other uh, labs that have done this uh, with, with uh, asymmetric re um, recordings. So, so, so ear symmetry is not a factor for us uh, in our experiments, but is a crucial factor in individuals, let's say with unilateral hearing loss or unilateral tinnitus. And um, um, you know, there's, there's subtle differences when you record from right ear and left ear. Uh, but the, for the most part, um, it's not very prominent. So it's, it's, it's very uh, open to, unless you have a, a disorder that affects one side or the other, for the most part, this can be done um, bilaterally. Okay. Well, this is the last question, but again, and again, it, it, you know, tinnitus is a top, hot topic a lot of times on our, our webinar series, but does tinnitus show up in the FFR graph or does the brain introduce tinnitus later in the sound processing pathway? Mixed evidence there, as is with almost every study with uh, tinnitus, and that's partly, we think, because of the heterogeneity. So uh, I, I think, I think, um, uh, the effects of tinnitus can, can, isn't just uh, related uh, to the cortex. It can be seen evidence uh, much earlier. And again, I think our view is that uh, we really need to see the brain as a whole system and that these, these, uh, these brain structures that are early in encoding uh, are also controlled by the, the higher level st structures. So it's really kind of a system operation. So evidence with FFRs are mixed, and we think that's partly due to heterogeneity, but this is something, a line of work that we're pursuing, so we should be able to answer that. Um, part of what we're trying to do is, uh, is, is try our best to make, you know, uh, uh, make the population as homogenous. So we're only looking at individuals with tinnitus who have completely within clinical normal hearing. So to remove the issue related to, to hearing, deficits. We're also looking at patients with no hyperacusis because that can have its own set of consequences. So hopefully making that group a uh, little more stratified can allow us to, to answer that question better. But right now it's mixed evidence. That was our last question. Um, I want to thank everybody again and uh, Dr. Snyderman, Dr. Johnson. Um, again, thank you both. Um, the, and, and for the collaboration related to what we're doing uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, broth on on this very interesting topic and and um, you know I, I if you are any other questions pl please feel free to send those to us via email and we'll get to those and um, want to again welcome everybody and invite you to our next webinar which will be in two weeks um, we are going you know is still on this path every other week to do these and uh, uh, thank you and have a great day. <laughs>